quite a pleasure to welcome Tobias Faber to the College of Architecture and Planning. He has come to lecture two places in America. He's come to Ball State University and he's going uh, on Wednesday for a series of lectures similar to these at the University of Tennessee. He is a graduate of Denmark's Royal Academy. He has been a teacher there since 1951. He has been rector of the academy since 1964. That's 15 years. The academy uh, now has 1,600 students. He taught at MIT 25 years ago, and uh, uh, that was his last visit to this country. In the meantime, he has visited Thailand, Turkey, Isfahan, Japan, and he's crossed Russia and China on the Trans-Siberian Express, and I think he may tell us about that tonight. We'd like to welcome uh, Tobias Faber back to the USA and to Indiana and to Ball State and to the College of Architecture and Planning. Professor Faber. <laughs> Does that would work? I hope so. I hope so. Yes, yeah, thank you very much for a nice introduction. I can just uh, tell you that when uh, Charlie Sartenfield called me a month ago, I immediately I said, yes, I would be happy to come and wouldn't argue too much about it, that uh, uh, you wanted to have a a Dane to speak about China. There must be many others who could do that uh, so much closer. But uh, to me, it was an opportunity to come back to the United States and see it again. And I'm very happy being here. And I have had a wonderful day in, in seeing uh, uh, many interesting things in, in, in Indianapolis and in uh, Columbus. First, I want to tell you is it all right for you to, to can, can it adjust, shall I do anything like that? Does it work? Good. First I want to tell you that I have been interested in China and Chinese architecture for about 40 years. As young architects, young Utsang, whom you may know from the Sydney Opera House and I, were collaborating about several projects and competitions and in a period of a great interest for Japanese architecture all over the architectural world, we learned from books that Chinese architecture not only were basic for Japanese buildings and structures, but may be still more interesting. Later in life, Utsan and I were happy enough to visit China before the country was opened up for shuttle tours and personally, I visited China as late as October 76 on an individual trip together with my wife. May I get the first slide, please? Please, too. Or shall I do anything? No, then we should have to go to back. No, what's going on? That's good. That's good. And the other one? That's not that. It must be that street. Our first impression of the new China was the Chinese train and wagons of the Trans-Siberian Railroad from Moscow to Peking on the Yaroslavsky Railway Station in Moscow. The train was clean inside and outside every morning on our tour of six days and six nights. The inside 
of uh, the wagons was characterized by old luxury with mahogany panels on the walls, silk curtains for the windows, comfortable sofa and armchair, and standard lamp on the table in the compartment for two, where the Chinese crew served tea all day long, prepared on a samovar in the elegant corridor. Even the Russian and Siberian landscape was rather monotonous in October, snow during four days. The trip was pleasant and nice. You had time to prepare yourself for a new continent and a new and old culture on the opposite side of the globe. When we had passed the plateau of Mongolia with camels in snow, we met the red-brown color of the soil of China in the province of Inner Mongolia. After five days and nights, the train climbed the high and wild mountains, and the train made a stop at the Great Wall of China, the old bordering to the north and west of the Ming Dynasty China. Shall we try that? How does that work? Hey, there you are. At the map here, you have uh, Mongolia, and we entered up here from the north coming down here and to Peking, and later we uh, went uh, down to Nanking and uh, Suzhou and Shanghai, down to, to uh, Canton and uh, uh, Hong Kong. The wall is following the steep curves of the mountains, and in the landscape, the wall is outlining the hilly terrain for at last to disappear for your eye in the red-brown colors of the soil and the autumn leaves of the growth of sinkly trees and bushes. During the Han Dynasty, 200 years before Christ, the wall was built up of earth from the soil, but replaced by the Ming emperors around 1400 by a seven to nine meter high and six to seven meter wide structure faced with stones and bricks. With regular intervals, watch towers are raised four meters above the remaining wall furnished with castellated battlements. The 2,500 miles long wall was of course mainly built in order to defend the country against outer enemies but it functioned too as a route for communication in the vast pass list districts for troops and tradesmen, and five horsemen could easily ride beside each other, a magnificent and moving edifice. After six days and six nights, we arrived not one minute late, not one minute too early, but exactly 1530 at the main railroad station, a typical piece of contemporary Chinese architecture for a public building. Spacious and comfortable in concrete, steel and glass, international style up to the roof, which is elaborated as an architectural game with traditional roof forms, strange for a functionalistic approach to architecture, but deliberately done in China in order to gain 900 million people's understanding and feelings for an identification. A reception room furnished with gigantic armchairs is to be found in all terminals and railway stations. Tea will be served uh, during the first welcome and introduction to a new city. In an elegant limousine with private driver and guides, the Guests are driven down the huge main street, Chang'an, with thousands of bicycles to the very best hotel in Peking, Hotel Peking. Constructed in three periods from 1927 to 1976 in three different styles, but everywhere in spacious scale. Our bathroom could easily room a cocktail party of 50 guests, and you will meet service of a Fifth Avenue Hotel, Anno 1925. 
The Peking Hotel is situated a few minutes walk from the city central square, Tiananmen, the square of heavenly peace, where you will find the main entrance to the imperial forbidden city, the national monument for heroes of the revolution, and finish as late as 1977, the mon uh, memorial for Mao Zedong. At the sides of the square is situated the National Museum and the House of the People in a monumental classicistic style, rooming Congress Auditorium for 5,000 people, a theater for 10,000 spectators, and an innumerable amount of other rooms. <clears throat> My wife and I arrived to Peking the day after the announcement of the new chairman, Hua Kuofeng, celebrated by one million people on the square of Tiananmen. Thousands of nice-looking children dressed in a variety of colors visited the square the following day. The plan of Peking is close to be a square as all other old cities of China. In correspondence to the old philosophy, cities as well as all buildings should be placed in harmony with nature. And that does not in China mean in relation to actual situation and curvings of the landscape, but in relation to abstract symbols. The circle symbolizes heaven and the square symbolizes the earth. The old capital of the Tang Dynasty, Chang'an, as you see to your right, was constructed, constructed as such a square, situated exactly with main interest, entrance to the south, and the main actual road Symmetri uh, symmetrically dividing the city up into two identical parts and with the palace of the emperor in front. The city was protected by a wall with three gates on each side. In the Chinese language, one will find the same word, king, for wall and city. Chang'an was divided up in a regular grid of streets and each block was subdivided by alleys. From the alleys was entrance to the family dwelling plots, which were subdivided in a smaller system of buildings and courtyards. All blocks were surrounded by walls, and all plots again by lower walls. A Chinese city is a box system of still smaller but well-defined boxes. Peking was founded by the Mongolian Hill, the drum tower, the bell tower, and the axis is not an avenue like Champs Elysees in Paris or Fifth Avenue. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, in New York, where you can see from one end of the street to the other, but it's a series of open and closed spaces. To the left of the palace, you will find the Imperial Gardens. And uh, symmetrical placed in relation to the axis, the main sanctuary is the Temple of Heaven and the Temple of Agriculture. Each entrance gate to the city includes two gate buildings, an altar gate with a heavy resistant basis in brick for defense, a solid construction. I didn't think that happened with that. No, that's the other one, excuse me. There you are. Let's see if we can get this one. Yeah? That's a about interior space. And a more elaborated inner gate with a series of open balconies and interior quarters of the guard who made the daily watching from the upper parts of the city wall. Observe the contrast between the solid basis and the abundant detailing of the upper part. Contrast emphasizing each other, only by contrast the Chinese felt they were able to create the harmony, a basic law in Chinese architecture. You will find 
the main gate to the imperial city on the main south-north city axis on the square of the heavenly peace, where all national ceremonies of Mao China take place. Three bridges in white marble cross a golden stream in front of the gate and above the central gateway is the portrait of Chairman Mao still exposed. On the plan, you see the imperial city with government buildings and the imperial gardens, the forbidden city and cold hill, and the, from the Chang'anmen, you will pass another gate before you meet the real gate of the forbidden city. And that's the Wumen gate. And that gave in former time access to the forbidden city for the selected visitors who entered by the side doors. The central gateway was reserved for the emperor personally. The gate building is a three-wing structure with solid lower story in contrast to a hall above the central part and pavilion-like superstructures ending up the side wings. The imperial palace covers a rectangle of 3,150 feet by 2,460 feet surrounded by walls with four gates, one on each, on each side, and a 150 feet broad moat. The area is divided up in three sections from south to north. One, two, three. The central section includes three great halls and ceremonial squares. There. First the forecourt of the Golden Stream, then the main square of the three great halls, which are raised on the three-floor high platform, and the northern part of the Forbidden City is the private living area for the imperial family, with three smaller halls in the, inter inter in the center section but moreover a labyrinth of innumerable one-story buildings and courtyards. The private living area connects with a private garden to the north, up there, um, and uh, in the two sections to the east and west is placed storehouses, libraries, theaters, and dwellings for the staff. We pass the Wumen Gate out to the forecourt of the Golden Stream, which centrally is closed up by the Gate of Supreme Harmony. The Golden Stream is crossed by five elaborated bridges in white marble, here seen on the basis ground of the north side of Wumen. The Golden Stream runs in winding curves in a compositional conscious contrast to the regularity of the building scheme. And the five elaborated bridges and their reflections in the stream emphasize the beauty and harmony gained by the contrast. More than a thousand years before Christ, the Chinese formed a building, a building time for a hall with columns of wood in one, two, three, four, or five bays, always with one of the long sides as main facade and entrance, and if possible, will a main facade turn to the south. The roof is supported by beams and rafters in wood, and if the span was too wide, the Chinese made a system of secondary beams supported by vertical pieces of wood. The Chinese never learned the static advantage of triangular constructions like a European roof truss. The Chinese structures are due to that mostly over-dimensioned. Uh, but the Chinese system gave possibilities to make changes in the slope of each uh, roof as uh, well known in the characteristic pliable endings of the roof. The interiors of the hall were seldom subdivided by partitions but were kept as uh, peristyle halls. The Chinese prefer to build halls in different sizes for different purposes. The building type was presumably first built as a hall of a prince 
And in the principle, the hall was in China kept traditionally as the main building structure for 3,000 years up into our century. Each generation of craftsmen has continued the tradition, which around the year of 500 after Christ includes the ceremonial hall for Buddhistic services when the Buddhistic religion was introduced from India. And each generation has tried to refine the proportions and the detailing. And for the roofs, there were different types. The simple pitched roof. Oh, that was the wrong one. Yeah. Up there. The half, in a, the hip end roof. The half hip end roof. And the pyramidal roof and all with varieties in double floors, and all selected in relation to the importance of the actual building. The main hall of the Forbidden City, the Hall of Supreme Harmony, is covered with a distinguished of all roofs, the doubled hipped end roof, covered with yellow glazed tiles. The form and the elegance of the pliable slope is perfect. It looks as it was the roof floating above the wooden structure, which seems to be secondary to the roof, and the three-floor-high basic platform. The harmony is obtained through the contrast between the elegance of the roof and the solidity of the platform. You see, the Chinese never looked at architecture as an art like the European Spille Arte. The Chinese arts were rituals, music, poetry, and mathematical calculations. Architecture was a craft with unavoidable traditions and, and rules for creating harmony with nature. Harmony obtained by contrast, just as in all other relations in life and between people in the yin and yang philosophy. Of course, the Chinese builders knew about proportion, the rhythm, tensions, composition, texture, and all the other architectural elements we know of. But a Chinese builder would never think of creating anything original, never before seen. As an architectural tradition, he estimated since the Renaissance in the Western world. The Chinese builders just wanted to refine the tradition of still more perfect solutions. And with such an established tradition through 3,000 years, it's explicable that the Chinese has no special veneration for old buildings and monuments as such. If a structure was old and badly kept, the Chinese has always torn it down and built a new and better one of the same sort. And therefore, there are few buildings in China older than a thousand years. Nothing like the Egyptians or the Greek and the, even the European uh, cathedrals. The whole of supreme harmony is a five bay structure with open colonnade to the south. The Chinese will always make an important facade sunny and let the approaching visitor have the sun on their back. Several steps bring the visitor up the three platforms. The central step has a ramp elaborated in white marble with dragons, and above this, this ramp, the emperor was carried in a sedan chair. Behind the Hall of Supreme Harmony and placed on the same platform is the Square Hall of Perfect Harmony and the Rectangular Hall of the Preservation of Harmony. And in the Perfect Harmony Hall, the emperor was resting on a throne in between ceremonies each lasting for hours. The platform for the three great hall has the form of a Greek cross, which are giving possibilities for interesting intersections by the big stairways and their balustrades. Observe the yellow roofs and red walls and columns. East of the great hall are courtyards, surrounded by buildings in one or two stories. All variations of the same time are building, but different in size and mutual situation. 
The whole of preservation of harmony is seen from the north with its doubled half hip end roof, secondary to the roof of the supreme harmony roof. The emperor's private living area is protected from the more official part of the forbidden city by a wall and new gates. The gateway is embellished with ornaments in green tile. The gateway has red painted doors with golden rivets. The gateway opens up to a street or a promenade etched by walls with new gateways to the many living areas. The different emperors lived in different areas and they had usually large families, sons and daughters, uncles and nephews who all lived inside the forbidden city. A gateway to a living area opens up to a wall of spirit which would preserve the inmates for wicked ghosts who never could turn right angles. The scale of the buildings of the living area is surprisingly small. All buildings are in one story. In fact, there was a very small difference between the daily surroundings of an emperor of China and the typical Chinese house for an average citizen with its system of bigger and smaller courtyards with different functions. This house rooms the living room area for the last emperor and is not much bigger than most one-family houses in your country. And I can tell you that the bedrooms of an emperor were small like cabins. But of course, the emperor could use the many big halls when he wanted to see people around. <clears throat> Even in the living area, the roofs were embellished with small sculptures in glazed tile, mostly animals with different symbolic meaning, all in order to protect the inmates. Central in the living area are placed three halls, after the same system as the three great halls, but smaller in scale, here the emperor celebrated private festivals, birthdays, weddings, and so on, and here he gave diploma to students with exceptional fine marks. My wife and our wonderful guide, Tui, enter one of the platforms. In the palace of heavenly purity, we can study the rich ornamentation and bright colors but the use of colors are never chosen after an individual artistic selection. The colors have their traditional symbolic function. The red color is the color representing the sun, virility, strength, life-giving, masculine. And the red color was used in buildings for all loading elements, walls and columns. The blue and the green were symbols for femininity and all the supported carried elements, beams, rafters, ceilings, were painted mainly in blue or green colors. The yellow color is the most distinguished. It's the emperor's color, the color of power, and only his buildings could carry yellow roofs as we have seen in the Forbidden City. But in the blue and green colors of beams and ceilings were ornaments in gold. I'm afraid it's very dark, but you <coughs> may see it's, it's this one there. Because the female color in relation to yin and yang were yellow or gold. But it's only in the subordinated detailing we find this change in sex use of color. A Chinese will understand the connection. In temples and palace halls is an abundant use of ornamentation on beams and boards of the ceilings after special rules. The Chinese builders could learn about it in thousand years old instructive architectural books about traditional structures. The Chinese will understand the symbols. We can just look at it as abstract ornaments. The red doors of the Palace of Heavenly Purity are richly decorated with golden ornaments but supporting columns and walls are never embellished with decoration. The importance of their strength and loading function shall be respected. 
North of the living area is the private garden, and from there we find the northern gateway still in the axis with the golden rivers on the red doors. The northern gate building is here seen from the south with its three gateways from which the visitor leaves the Forbidden City and from which you can see the Coal Hill artificially made out of earth from the three, three lakes. There's something that's happened over there. I'm afraid. Yeah. That's that. Uh, artificially made out of earth from the three lakes in the Imperial Gardens. On the top of the hill is placed a small temple just in the main axis of Peking. Outside the imperial city is still big areas of ordinary housing, all in one story, because no man was allowed to look across the wall into the emperor's palace. All housings are gray, walls and roofs, all gray. Ordinary people was not allowed to use the emperor's yellow color and the blue color, the symbol for heaven, as seen in the temple area of heaven. That would say that Peking in old days, seen from above, from the city walls, for example, was readable and understandable for all people of China, even if they were not able to read or write. Only the main entrance door of the ordinary housing is red, because the red color, too, is a symbol for joy and a happy life. In the southern part of Peking is placed the most important sanctuary of China, the Temple of Heaven, where the emperor every year had to pray for the harvest before sowing time. The ceremony lasted a whole day from early morning to late evening, and the emperor stayed overnight from the day before in the Palace of Abstinence, in the temple area. The enclosure is nearly four miles long. On the main axis from the north to the south is the circular hall for prayer of God good harvest. In the middle, the small temple, the imperial heavenly vault. And to the south, the great heavenly altar uh, where the main ceremony took place. The hall of prayer there, to your left, is in three stories and placed on a three stories high platform of the same type as we have seen in the Forbidden City. The roofs are in deep blue glazed tiles, the color of heaven. The interior of the Hall of Prayer is covered with a dome supported by red columns and we recognize the blue, green and golden colors in the ceiling. The small imperial heavenly vault has its own enclosure, a wall with three gateways turned to the south and the heavenly altar. The circular building is built in wood, as the hall of prayer was resting on a, uh, on a one-story high platform and covered with a conic blue roof. The hall is rooming tablets for the ceremonies, tablets for the spirits of the sky, of the sun, tablets for the moon, the stars, the thunder, and tablets for ancestors of the emperor. The great heavenly altar is encircled by two low enclosures, one square, one circular, surmounted by blue tile, and towards all four points of the sky are triple marble porticos giving admittance to the altar. From the altar one can look back to the heavenly vault. The altar consists of three concentric platforms, all each with marble balustrades and with a total diameter uh, of 200 feet. The holy number of nine recurs several times in the arrangement of the blocks of stone and flagstones and give a beautiful, simple geometrical system for the refined detailing. With the platform as basis, the horizon is as uh, frame and the sky as vault created the imperial ceremony, a union between the yin principle, the female earth, and the yang principle, the masculine sun, lightness and strength, a union for fertility, for maintenance of life. 
The altar and the halls are surrounded by a wood of firs, and still today the buildings of Peking cannot be seen from the altar. The sky and horizon is still the dominating dimension. Peace, solemn, solemnity, harmony characterize this may be most moving monument in Peking. Will you allow me to take off this one? Thank you. <clears throat> Each dynasty of all Chinese emperors have their own tomb areas, different places in China. Certain emperors of the Ming dynasty are buried outside Peking in a valley between mountains in a widespread area. From the south, one first meets a gigantic portico built in marble, but it's easy to recognize all structural details from wooden structures. The Chinese don't feel any guilt by using formal elements from one material to the other. If the Chinese could afford a more resistant material, they did it. From the portico, a sacred way is bordered by great sculptures of men and animals, lions and camels, or elephants. Two of each animal, one is standing up, one resting on the ground. The animals of uh, the uh, Ming period look friendly and humorously. They were supported to join the dead emperor and protect him in the future. Even warriors and civil ministers are to be seen at the sacred way due to the Confucian training, they would be loyal to the emperor into eternity. On the plan, to your right, you see the situation with the 13 tombs. Each one is an extensive construction with many buildings, courtyards, and gardens, besides a huge tumulus, a burial mound. The tomb of Emperor Yang Li who died 1424, has an enclosure more than 2,000 feet long. One has to pass several halls and open areas before coming to the steel tower at the tumulus, a thousand feet in diameter and yet not excavated. Inside the tower, a steel of stone tells about the Emperor Zhang Li's merits. The tower is racing about above a basic structure in the terraced terrain. The corners of the roofs show up an elaborated system of brackets in wood, more brackets than necessary for decorative reasons. From the terrace of the tower is a beautiful view over the tomb valley where you can look from one tomb to the other. Only one of the certain tombs has been excavated 20 years ago. It was not easy to find the not shown entrance to the sepulchral chamber in a tumulus of 800,000 square feet. The idea from the beginning was, of course, that no one ever should find it. 600,000 workers were busy in four years at that time when the tomb was constructed. And the emperor, Van Lu, was 22 years old when he was nominated emperor and it was his first imperial decision to start the construction. And the tomb was ready about 20 years before he died. After the excavation, a convenient accessible entrance was made, as you can see there on the picture to your left, so that visitors today can get down to the sepulchral system of chambers. The drawing shows vaulted halls faced with marble ceremonial halls for the dead emperor and his two wives with eternal burning oil, oil lamps. The last and biggest hall room, the coffins of the emperor and the two empresses, and 26 chests containing an unbelievable amount of golden treasures, today exposed in a simple wooden shed. In Europe or in the United States, you would have to hide them in the deepest vaults of your banks for safety and just expose copies. For the moment, it's not easy to get away with precious robberies in Mao China. The Chinese has never used foreigners as slaves. They made their own slavery. 
Unbelievable sufferings and deaths of millions of simple workers and farmers have been the condition for Chinese monuments like the big tombs and the Mao channels telling about that story too. A big pictures of the world. The Imperial Summer Palace is situated in the most beautiful hilly area west of Peking. It's not much more than 200 years ago when an artificial lake was picturesque, with picturesque islands and peninsulas were digged and the palace pavilion built. But all buildings were burnt down in the late 19th century of European troops but rebuilt by the last Empress Tzu Tsi in the 1890s. A long curved corridor followed the borders of the lake and European influence is to be seen in naturalistic paintings. You cannot see them, but I can tell they are there. Above, in the inside of the roof beams. All Chinese ornamentation is based on abstract geometrical patterns. The dowager loved to stay in her summer palace. She built many new pavilions, some in traditional style, others like the marble stone boat formed like a paddle steamer in two stories. Architectonically are the well-preserved marble bridges connecting small islands to the shore most interesting. The 17-arch bridge shows up uh, the refined tradition for bridge structure in China. The lucidity of the arches and the curving line of the balustrades, in contrast to the quiet surface of the lake, create the harmony which is the Chinese builders' endeavor of all architecture. The traditional farmer's house in the countryside has, of course, different elaboration in detail in different parts of the huge country. But common characteristics are the one-story wing with all windows in one of the long sides turned to the south. Contemporary housing schemes in the cities have few traditional Chinese elements. They are built up by industrialized methods and they look from the outside international as housing schemes all over the world. Most common are three or four story wings, rooming two or three room apartments, where the traditional family pattern still exists. Sons and daughters live together with their parents until they have finished their studies and are ready for marriage uh, in the age of 24 to 29. Grandmothers live together with the family, taking care of the cooking and the children when they are, when they are small. The most sympathetic characteristic of the housing scheme seen from outside are the trees and the greenery in between the blocks. A rather new Chinese law tells that 70% of all tree areas is supposed to be planted. And, and they are really planted. The trees are giving shadow in the summers and make even rather monotonous developments look more charming. Visits in schools are most stimulating. Even the school buildings have very little to offer, more than the most necessary. In this school class, outside Peking, I was asked to take over the lesson. Expected something extremely disciplined, and they could only answer in chorus and so forth, but they uh, behaved beautifully. In Nanking, we had to admire the Nanking Bridge crossing Yangtze Kiang. It started 1950 with Russian consultants, Russian materials, Russian money. But when the climate between Russia and China became more chilly, the Chinese had to build the bridge themselves. And they did it beautifully, which gave a self-confidence. The bridge is today a national, that bridge is today a national symbol for Chinese power based entirely on own forces. Pictures of the bridge is to be seen everywhere in public buildings, as photos, as paintings, or embroideries in sizes of two, three hundred square feet. Outside Nanking is the memorial for Sun Yat-sen, the first president for the republic, and even today a most estimated personality in contemporary Chinese history. The memorial is built in traditional style about 
1925 on a slope in the mountains and char characterized by a most imposing stairway and the memorial is the favorite place for excursions. <coughs> Suzhou is situated by the Great Canal connecting the rivers Yangtze and Huanghou. The landscape is flat and um, uh, traversed by canals. One learns that in China most transportation of goods still go to the seaway in boats or barges along the rivers and the canals. And Suzhou looks today not far from the old paintings here from 1125 of the city Kaifeng with its canal, bridges, one-story buildings and streets crowded with people. All buildings in Suzhou are whitewashed, typical for cities in southern China, south of Yangtze Kiang. Barges covered with sheds are going and coming, and many families are living in their boats. Suzhou is the most charming city. The housings are built after the same principle as in Peking, close to the streets, but open up into small courtyards. The shops in Suzhou are open to the streets without glasses in the window openings. We saw no queues in front of the shops and plenty of food to buy. There are trees in all streets. The leaves cover the streets, affording shades to the pedestrians and bicyclists, and we saw only few motor cars in Suzhou. The leaves from the streets draw shadows on the whitewashed walls. Blue shirts are hanged for drying. Up there. <clears throat> On sticks in between the branches of the trees and the wall. And many activities in private families take place in the streets, even hair washing. Suzhou is well known for its art and craft industry. The silk production is famous. Here you see a spinning wheel. Each person manufactures one silk cord out of about 50 cocoons. In the other picture, we see a production of fans made of sandalwood. The Chinese try to maintain all old crafts, lacquer, paperware, jade carving, embroidery, and so on. A topic for another lecture. Sorry, I don't know what's happened there. <clears throat> Does it work again? Yes. Good. Uh, to each factory is connected a kindergarten with a wonderful open-minded children who, unembarrassed, appeared individually singing or dancing. Later, the whole class were singing defamatory poems about Gang of the Four with the same innocence as American children singing Mary had a little lamb or old MacDonald had a farm. In Suzhou, on the Tiger Hill, is a famous pagoda situated from around 900, slanting like the slanting tower in Pisa, built in stone, but with all detail inspired from constructions in wood, as we can see it so many places in China. Probably a pagoda in wood was to be found before 900 and replaced by this new one in a more resistant material. From the very beginning, a pagoda is a shrine, safe keeping a bone or belonging to Buddha, developed from Indian stupas. But how the three, four or five stored pagoda has arisen is difficult to say. One theory, theory tells that the watch towers from Han Dynasty time, around Christ uh, when he was born, as they are shown in the ceramic models inside the tombs of the time 2,000 years ago. The best place to study old Chinese pagoda is in Japan, where well-kept pagodas from around 700, like Hojuji in Nara, are erected by Chinese monks and builders. The development of the pagoda from a shrine to a decorative element, even in the Chinese landscape, is an interesting story, but too long for this lecture. 
I think we have to make a stop, to make a cha uh, uh, change uh, for the slides. <coughs> To understand Chinese gardens, it's necessary to know a little about the two main tendencies in old Chinese philosophy. Confucius, you see him to your left, lived around 500 before Christ and wrote down laws for a Chinese society, reasonable and realistic, in order. What does? In order. Uh, to get stability and a society to work, laws for relations between fathers and sons and the citizens to the total society, between master and servant. And all the emperor's civil officers were educated after the laws of Confucius up to 1911 in this century, drawing sumps, diking rivers and lakes, building up roads and cisterns, Construction of cities, and of cities were all done in relation to Confucian laws. But Confucius has no comfort to this, no advice for mental difficulties in, uh, in the fight of life. And the antagonism to Confucianism is Taoism, inspired by the poet Lao Tzu. You see him to your right who lived about a hundred years before Confucius. And Fa Lao Tzu was the loss of nature, the meaning of human life. He didn't believe in laws created by human beings. Poetry, mystery, fancy, humor is essential for a Taoist. And a life in meditation, out in wild and virgin nature, is an ideal in Taoism. But even Confucianism and Taoism are antagonists. A Confucianist and a Taoist is not necessarily two different persons. A serious civil officer in a Confucian administration may want to live as a Taoist in his weekends. Confucianism and Taoism are both part of life. Antagonists like yin and yang, man and woman, Contrast which together may create harmony. The dream about the ideal life in meditation is to be seen in Chinese paintings. The Ch Chinese word for painting means mountain and water. In most old paintings we see wild mountains and violent streams and always we find a man and a small pavilion somewhere. But it was difficult in old days to get to the mountains. Therefore, you had to bring nature and symbols for nature, for mountains, into the city and into the houses. If you were wealthy enough, you could make a garden, bigger or smaller in relation to your house, and act or play as you were in real nature. If you were poor, you might just put a stone and some water on a plate, place it on your table, and in your med uh, meditation, you would call it the islands of happiness. In a garden, you have possibilities to meditate and search for the meaning of life. The most beautiful private gardens in China is to be found in Suzhou. Liu Yuan has an entrance from the street as you enter the normal Chinese house. From outside is no garden, no trees to be seen. The four courtyards or atrium are embellished by flowers of the season. Here, chrysanthemum, because I visited uh, in the autumn, but it's quiet room for preparation of the mind. Liu Yuan is uh, of 10 acres and the biggest garden in Suzhou. If you look upon the plan, you see many separate buildings, all in direct relation to parts of the garden. You live in a garden. A garden is a dwelling as well. In the middle of the plan, you see a pond or lake in relation to small streams and areas with uh, gathered stones creating symbols or mountains. Mountains and waters are the main components of a garden. And from no place in the garden, you can survey the totality. 
from no place you can see from where the water is coming. The lake is the symbol for the sea, for the rivers, which are organic part of earth, like arterias in the human body. A visit in a garden is a walk with continuous changings and experiences. You climb a mountain, cross by bridges the water to an island. Sometimes you are close to the surface of the water and the next minute far above. You are following winding passes which never will cross each other but just meet in curvings. You use all your senses. You listen to water, to the birds, the frogs, the leaves moving in the wind. You smell the flowers. And the main idea is not just to make something aesthetically beautiful, but to create a micro world of nature, including mountains, rivers, trees, flowers, animals, birds, fishes, everything you might meet in real nature. All pavilions and places have poetic names, Hall of the Mandarin Ducks, Pavilion of the Blue Distance, Heritage of the Clouds, Hall of Perfume, and so on. And all buildings are whitewashed. We are in the southern China. In between the many exciting experiences, you need an empty room space, just characterized by simple forms, sun and shadow, as a place for rest and cleaning up your mind and your thoughts. Extremely important are interesting and remarkable stones, painted by artists and collected and placed in the garden. A wise man always greeted a big stone in his garden in the morning, my old brother, he said, going to the stone. In another Suzhou garden, plain man's political garden, are buildings like the double gabled house to the left, plastered and with strong character in the black carved gables, and architrave to the door. Other buildings are open pavilions or just covered corridors closed by a plastered wall to one side in order to emphasize the subdivision of the garden. The relation to the lotus pond is close. The water reflects even the shadows. The interiors of the buildings are roomy and airy. They are rather high to the ceiling and there are possibilities for open relation to the garden especially to the south. The window openings are covered with screens perforated in many, many different patterns, intersecting simple geometrical forms, the circle, the square, the oval, the triangle, which visually maintains the plan of the wall. At the same time, they make it possible to look out into the garden. In winter, the window screens may be covered with rice paper or even with shutters due to heating problems. Contrary to the Japanese, the Chinese have a thousand of years old tradition for using movable furniture. In between the buildings are often very small open spaces, courtyard characterized with just one type of planting, a bamboo bush or a plum tree of a very strong effect against the whitewashed walls. The harmony is here created by contrast between the smooth plan of the wall and the natural form of branches and leaves. The doors and windows are given many different contours, square, rectangular, oval, or formed like a calabash. Of all contours are the circular moon door admired as the most perfect frame for a view out into the garden. Here to the left, seen in a bigger courtyard, where the bamboo bushes are the only type of vegetation with their beautiful shadows on the white wall. A small square pavilion in plain man's political garden has four moon doors, one to each side. And sitting inside, in the middle of the pavilion, one could get four different views out into the garden, but all perfectly framed by the moon door like a painting. One can look out to the water of the pond, to some interesting other building, to a beautiful bamboo, or the pattern of a plated fence. Even walls subdividing the gardens into sections, many have moon doors, forming a part of coming experience in the next section. 
The walls have often window with pattern screens, as we have seen in the interior of the buildings. Important elements in the Chinese gardens are small circular or octagonal kiosks, small pavilion, and the bridges. Crossing a bridge, one is close to the water level with possibilities for continuous new views for one's eye with water in the front, and one is close to the beauty and smell of the lotus flower. We will find vaulted bridges in white painted wood or zigzag form bridges in stone impossible for wicked ghosts to cross. The pavilion or kiosk are the place for quiet meditation. When you are sitting under the curved roof, able to look in all directions in the middle of the pond. From the pavilion you can look upon the moon and the stars, and as the philosopher says, in the airy pavilion one can drink the red wine in summertime while the wind is blowing into a bamboo, and in wintertime one can sit close to a small charcoal heated oven and melt the snow for the tea water together with one's girlfriend. The garden paving is made with great care in courtyards and passes. In the places where people are supposed to step is used shingles or pebbles, but in the areas where no one is stepping can the pebbles have size, size like goose eggs or bigger, in, uh, still bigger. And everywhere the paving is made with patterns partly geometrically designed, partly with pictures of animals, birds or plants. And from the courtyard, on the slide to your left, you see a door opening in the wall to the right. If one is standing in the courtyard and from one point is looking through the framing door into the main section of the garden of the master of the net, one will get a different picture just by moving the upper part of the body. In one frame picture, a gable of a building is in focus. In the next, it's a small symbol of a mountain. And in the third, a zigzag bridge is the dominating element. Because it's essential for all Chinese gardens that visitors are supposed to move extremely slowly, giving themselves time for meditation. For each step, new views, new experiences are possible. Trees and plants are not main elements in a Chinese garden. But of course they have their importance, not least because they are changing from time to time of the year, from one month to the other. Most beloved is bamboo, because its lightness and grace, its softness, its perseverance, uh, perseverance, painted again and again by the ten Chinese painters. The Chinese love the shadows of the bamboo leaves on the white wall and the rustling sound when the wind blows in the bamboo leaves. In the pond grow lotus, symbol for purity and truth, and for the Buddhists, it's a symbol for the throne of Buddha. The orchids symbolize female charm and reputation of the wise man. The peony is the flower for power and wealth, the sandamon the flower who rests, resists the frost, and due to that, it's a symbol for a long life. As the Japanese admire their cherry tree, the Chinese prefers the plum tree, not as much for the fruits as for the harmony between contrasts, the rough, crooked branches against the grace of the flowers. The Chinese worships the crooked mountain pine, which may look as a flat umbrella, and they love white stamped firs and high cypresses. But it seems so that the symbols and poetic qualities seem much more important for Chinese than the aesthetics. Essential is that the Chinese know that butterflies come with flowers, with willow trees come the cicads, that one listens to the wind in the spruces, uh, and that ban banana trees attract the rain. All trees and flowers attract some sort of insects and birds, which are necessary in order to create that microcosmos the Chinese always want to make out of a garden. Maybe you know the story about two wise Chinese men 2,500 years ago. Chuang Si said when they were walking by the river, 
Look how happy the trouts are today. And we see replied, how do you know that the trouts feel happiness? And Chuan replied, you are not me. How do you know that I shouldn't know how a truth feel? And Hui answered, well, of course I'm not you. So I cannot tell for sure what you know, but you are not a fish and cannot know about trout feelings. Finally, Chuang said, let us start with the beginning. You answered, how do we know if the trouts are happy? But in reality, you felt very well that I knew about it. I just judge from the joy and happiness we too feel by walking by the river. The railway in between Suzhou and Shanghai is placed in a fertile flat landscape with fields of vegetables or cotton. Everywhere the fields are crowded with hard-working people. The Chinese know that it's possible to make the same work with machinery and less people. But machines are expensive, still more expensive than labor so far. Some places in the Shanghai area, one will find the machineries in use and just beside fields without. The people involved will get the same salary for their work, and that's the famous two-leg system. Shanghai is a huge city with about 12 million inhabitants. The big harbor is busy as no other harbors I have seen, with old junks in between containers and other contemporary types of ships. The old junks are the most picturesque, Shanghai is situated along the river Huangpu and where the stream of Wusang meets Huangpu were the old western concessions to be found. The British, French, German, American concessions side by side. And all the concessions had to be part in the bond, the important street out to the river. And all the western built buildings from late 19th century are still there with new Chinese functions. The Shanghai Main Street Nanking Road has a curved contour. Nanking Road meets the bond in a right angle at the riverside. In Shanghai's Nanking Road are multi-story houses to be seen in between two-story buildings, sections bordered with trees and other ones without. It seems that Shanghai never had any laws for city planning Everyone has had the freedom to build what he would uh, like on his plot. In the secondary streets, we mostly find two-story housings. In Shanghai was the daily street papers very popular and dominating the main streets, partly by the size of the papers and cartoons on the wall, partly by the crowds of eager readers. The Gang of the Four was most actual late in 1976, Early in the morning, we observed on the flat roofs of the buildings and in the parks, the Chinese in their individual shadow boxing. Here a young father admired by his wife and the kid. The gymnastic training is a reminiscence of the Taoism's demand for keeping not only your mind, but your body in training. In Shanghai, it's possible to see new Chinese architecture housing schemes, public buildings, here a gymnasium with an audience of 80,000 people. Influence from Western architecture is evident. The architect of the auditorium, but here was really used an architect, was educated in the States, a very nice person as a matter of fact. The traditional Chinese attitude to architecture as a craft is still present. The Chinese use architecture architects mostly for public buildings, but without the same interest for experiments or person, personal expression as, for example, in Japan. Today, the Chinese have taken up the traditional theater and opera, which was not permitted after the Cultural Revolution when I was there, and the attitude from Gang of the Four before their decline. In late 1976, the performances were dominated by the circus acrobats and easy, understandable sketches from everyday life showing situations the audience could identify and feel stimulated to be good citizens in the, in the male China. 
From the southern China around Cantal, I'll just show a few slides. Here's an old ancestor temple. The architecture is at the same time more extravagant in the detailing and more heavy than in the north. The line of the roof more exaggerated and the rich embellished with many sculptural figures. In Canton or Guangzhou, it is still possible to see the island Xiamen, where all Western foreigners lived up to 1949, isolated by a canal from the Chinese part of the city. No Chinese was before that time allowed admission to the island. It's the most charming area with comfortable housing around a green with tropic vegetation of the area. Today, Xiamen is a recreational area for old people as well as for children. There are schools and social institutions in most of the buildings. The Chinese would never think of uh, throwing away buildings which can be uh, used for something new and better. In Canton, Chairman Mao, for a few years in the 1920s, was head of a political high school roomed in an old Confucian temple called Peasant Movement Institute. The interior of the bedroom and office of Chairman Mao and the dormitory of the students show up the utmost simplicity like a shaker society milieu. Today it's kept as a museum and inspiring ideal for new Carter schools all over China. From Canton, a train takes three hours in order to reach Hong Kong. The landscape is hilly and beautiful, with picturesque villages and many people working in the fertile fields. In spite of the skyscrapers, the streets of Hong Kong looks much more Chinese than any city in China I have seen, with many commercial signboards. About four out of five million inhabitants are Chinese, living a life of a capitalist society with a contrast of a few extremely wealthy and many poor people. In many ways, an absurdity to cl so close to the new male China. But exciting and beautiful due to the mountainous landscape of the islands and the panoramic view from the peak here seen by night and day, so different from any Chinese city. But Hong Kong was a nice place for us, relaxing with time to think over the extraordinary experience it had been to meet the Mao China, where an old culture and a new society was melted to a totality. The Chinese of today call China the a developing country, but it's different from any developing country I have seen, where Western culture and exploitation have resulted in improvements for a few people and deterioration for the majority. In China today you meet the old culture, not only in the monuments, but in the family patterns and the behavior of the individual Chinese. You feel that the improvements are for everyone, even though the standard still is far behind Western countries. It's of course impossible to transfer a system related to special conditions, but it's stimulating and inspiring for Western people to meet millions, men and women, believing in progress and the future. I wish you all a wonderful and suggestive visit in China. Thank you for your kind attention.